Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, so what we'll do now is just start off with some introductions. So I'll go first. My name is Aisha. I am the Youth Engagement Officer at Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital. Who would like to go next? I'll go next. Um, hi everybody. Hi Sir Bruce. Uh, my name is Zainab. I'm a young person from Think for Brum. I am co-chairperson and research lead. Been in Think for Brum for about a year and a half uh, and um, yeah, I've won the Diana Award and published my own book, so that's a bit about me. Well, please don't call me sir. My name's just Bruce. Okay, cool. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I, no, no, no. Please don't apologise. I just, yeah. It puts up. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Tamid. I'm the engagement lead for YPAG. I've been a YPAG member for about a year and a half now. Nice to meet you, Tamid. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Harikesh. Uh, I've been at YPAG for four months now. Yeah. Thanks. I'll go next. So hi everyone, I'm Hanya. I've been a member of YPAG for a couple of years now and I'm also a member of the NHS Youth Forum. Hi, I'm Beth and I've been a member of YPAG for just over a month now. Uh, thanks everybody. And uh, I'm Bruce Keogh, I'm the chairman of the trust and I guess you're going to ask me a whole bunch of questions about that now. Yeah, so ho hopefully they don't scare you off too much, Bruce. So um, Beth is going to kick us off with her with the first question. Yeah. Hi. Um, how did you get into the role of chair at BWC? Well, I had been a medical director of the health service or national medical director um, for just over a decade, and. I've lived in Birmingham since 1995 and I, I decided to step down from that role at NHS England because it meant living away from home most of the week. And um, once I'd stepped down, that kind of coincided with um, the advertisement for a chair to, um, to be chair of BWC and I threw my hat in the ring and I was lucky enough to get the job. So it was quite straightforward from that point of view, really. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so my question is, you must have had lots of experience to get the role as chair. Can you share some of your career highlights with us? Yeah, and I think um, that might just help me get to a kind of better answer for Beth's question, really, something that's a bit more in context. I was, um, I was brought up in Zimbabwe and um, I, I'd heard a, a program on the radio, on a little green and white um, transistor radio, which I was listening to in the garden, and it was about the National Health Service in England. Now, I'd never been to England, um, so I didn't really know what it was like. But I was really taken by the idea of the health service, and I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And I went in and asked my mum, said, to explain the health service to me and she did and she said to her one day she said or one day I said to her I'd like to um, I'd like to work in the health service and I then ran into a bit of difficulty because I didn't do very well in my A-levels um, and so I had to rewrite them that was a bit tricky and then after I'd rewritten my my A-levels I did some work and with some help with money that I'd earned and some help from my dad, I uh, got on a plane and came to England to, uh, to try and get into medical school. And that in turn turned out to be a bit tricky. I, I was rejected by 19 medical schools. That's the difference between you and me and told by many others not to even bother applying. So I think for me at a personal level, the biggest highlight was getting into medical school because that was my dream and something I wanted to do and something that hadn't been that easy, actually. Um, and if you fast forward a bit, I, um, I left medical school, I trained as a surgeon, ended up as a heart surgeon. I suppose the next highlight in my career was some research that I did with an Italian uh, professor when I was a newly appointed consultant, which was to, to assess the wisdom of doing a certain type of operation on the heart 
Um, and the background to this was that people with heart failure, they'd often, the, the teaching of the day, the wisdom said that you should not do coronary bypass operations on those patients because they all died. And the Italian guy who I was working with had been working with another group who um, had developed some science, which if it worked, meant that we could identify those patients who would benefit and those who wouldn't. So you would know exactly who to operate on. And the, the risk in all of that was that if the science was wrong and I operated on these patients, um, they would, you know, a number would die. And if the science was right, they wouldn't. So that was, that was a bit nerve wracking at one level, but in the end, everybody we operated on survived, which showed that the science was right. And that helped to change the, the practice of cardiac surgery along with other people around the world um, for the benefit of people who had heart failure. And I'm, I'm quite pleased about that. I guess the other, another highlight that I can is, one of the things I did when I first became a consultant was to set up a database. It took about 10 years to complete it, but of all the patients in this country undergoing heart surgery and doing it in a way that we had really detailed operation, uh, really detailed information on all of them. And as not long after I'd started that, there were problems with heart surgery in Bristol. Um, and children were dying. And uh, there was a very big inquiry led by somebody called Ian Kennedy um, that ended up making 196, I think, recommendations, one of which was that uh, patients should be able to get the, the results of surgery from their surgeons. And fortunately, because... I and other colleagues had started developing this database of, of operations performed in the country. We were able not only to, in time, give the results of um, heart surgery, not just by hospital, but by individual surgeons as well. And we were able to adjust those um, according to risk so that we could tell whether somebody was getting good results with low risk patients, high risk patients, medium risk patients. And, so on and so forth. And that was quite a, a highlight, I think, uh, to get to that place. And um, we now have 15 year follow up on all of those patients. And some of that data is, um, is actually used in children's heart surgery as well. So there's, I set up a thing called the National Institute for Cardiac Outcomes Research at University College London when I was a professor there. And um, that's used for documenting the results of all children's heart surgery in the country. So it, I guess if I were to sum it up, I think one of the, the things that I've always been keen on, I felt that if you're a surgeon or if you're somebody who's doing something to somebody else, you should be able to define what you're doing and how well you're doing it. Um, because I think every patient that submits themselves to treatment from somebody um, has a right to know how effective that treatment is and how good you are at delivering it. So that was uh, quite important. I think another thing that I'm uh, quite pleased with um, was some years ago when I was medical director for the health service, there was a review um, going on to look at the health service. And actually, um, the chief executive of the health service at the time was Sarah Jane Marsh's husband. Fantastic, um, a fantastic individual, uh, very clear thinker, very kind man, and very focused on patients in the health service. And anyway, under, under this review, which was going on and being led by somebody called Lord Darcy, um, he, he wanted to focus on quality of care in the health service. But nobody really knew how to define quality. People would say, oh, well, it's like beauty, you know, you know it when you see it. But that's not really good enough when you're trying to run something like the health service. And 
I had a deputy working for me at the time, uh, someone called Bill Kirkup, and his mum, who was 82, was about to undergo a heart operation. And she said to him, what's it going to be like? Will it work? And is it safe? And by will it work, she meant, um, will it make me better? And suddenly it dawned on us that his mum had suddenly got to the heart of what quality is. Does, does the treatment work? Is it safe? And what's it like? And so we set about thinking about that and thinking how you could use it in the, in the health service. And we ended up with a definition which is now enshrined in law of quality in the health service. And that is that whatever you do has, should be effective, it should be safe, and it should be as decent an experience for uh, the patient or their family as possible. And the advantage of, of those three things is you can measure each one of them. You can measure how effective a treatment is. You can measure simply by asking people what their experience of the treatment was. And you can measure safety by looking um, at safety related incidents. And suddenly we were in a position where we could, um, where we could start to have a pretty sensible conversation about what quality is. So I think that was quite a, a, a highlight in a way. Um, and, then, and then I was asked to think about how you, how you can turn the effectiveness bit, the, the outcomes, if you like, into the currency of the NHS. Because actually, when somebody comes to a hospital or goes to visit their GP or a physiotherapist, um, the one thing they want to know is, am I going to get better? You know, what are my chances of getting better? And I had to start thinking about how we defined outcomes. And you know, one of the, the great benefits I had was that I was working with very smart people. And there was a civil servant, young civil servant who worked with me. And I'd been thinking about this for two or three days. I hadn't been getting anywhere really. He rang me up, very excited. He said, hey, Bruce, he said, I think I've got it. He said, there are five things that any health system in the world should do. The first is it should stop you dying prematurely. And the main determinants of early mortality are really things like education, transport policy, housing policy, air pollution, all of those kind of things. Um, and, but there are certain things that, that a health service can do that also stop you dying early. So the way they treat your heart attack or the way it treats your stroke or, uh, or your cancer. The second thing is, he said, if you've got a, um, uh, a short-lived problem, it should help you get over it. And by that, what he meant was uh, a broken leg, a cataract operation, something that you, that you have a brief encounter with the health service with. You know, you're in, you get your treatment, you're out, you're better. And the third thing he said, which I think was particularly important, he said, the health system should help you to live well if you have a long-term condition or disability. You know, asthma, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, that kind of thing. And those three things fitted within, if you like, the, um, the domain or the heading of clinical effectiveness. He then said that the... The fourth thing was that whatever system it is should treat you decently. And I have to say, I think that's one of the weakest parts of our health service. In many respects, you're, you're expected to accept the treatment that's on offer rather than being asked what you want. Um, and that matters to people, actually. It certainly matters to me. I'm sure it matters to you guys. And I think we had, we got quite a bit of work to do there. And the final thing is he said that a, a good healthcare system should treat you safely. 
And I found myself thinking more and more about what safely meant. And I, I think what safely means, what it means in my head is that if you come into hospital and you've got something wrong with you, you accept that you have something wrong with you and you know what risks that might impose on you. Somebody offers you some treatment. They tell you about the treatment. You know what the benefits of the treatment are and, and what the risks are. And in your head, you trade off one against the other and say, you know, you can keep your treatment or I'll have it. What you should never have to bear in mind when you're making that calculation is that if we had designed and delivered our services better, the, the results of the treatment would be better. In other words, um, are, we, are we designing and delivering our services in a way that offers the opportunity for the very best results? Or have we got inbuilt errors in the way we design our system, which could end up in you not getting treatment as effective as it might be? So those five things um, ultimately ended up in something called the outcomes framework, which uh, was then used by the government for, for starting to look at the way services were delivered. So um, I was pleased about that. And I think if there's any take home message, you know, if you work with good people and you listen to what they say, um, there's an awful lot of good ideas out there. And then when I became um, chair of Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital, I found myself thinking, what is it that makes a good hospital? It sounds a really simple question, but you've got to dissect it out to, to understand it. And where I went to my head with this was, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to look after your staff. Now, the reason that you do that is because, firstly, if you get a reputation for being a place that looks after its staff, you can recruit better staff, so you get better people. Um, the second thing is that there is very clear scientific evidence that if you have happy and contented staff, the patients get better treatment, and that in turn um, can be translated into better outcomes, clinical outcomes for the patients. So there's, there's kind of, there's a good emotional argument for it, but there's also quite a good scientific argument. The second thing is that a good hospital should engage enthusiastically in research. And the reason for that is that those organizations that do research um, it's very clear they have better clinical outcomes for their patients across the board, not just in the areas where they do research. That's the reasons for that uh, are many, but one is that because you're doing research, you can attract better staff. Um, because you're doing research, the staff feel and the patients feel actually that they're at the cutting edge of treatment, which makes their jobs more interesting for the staff again which in turn plays into, into happier staff. And then finally, there's no such thing as a globally competitive hospital that isn't at the cutting edge of, of research in, in at least one area. The next thing that I think is important in, for a, a good hospital is that, for, that you know what your, your outcomes are for your treatments. And the health service isn't frankly very good at that. But I'm trying to get us in uh, BWC to a place that in pretty well every service that we offer, we have some way of measuring our outcomes so that we know how well we're treating our patients. And also, it's important about informed consent because if one of you guys comes into the clinic um, to have a discussion with a doctor or nurse, you'd quite like to know what the outcomes are of whatever it is they're offering. Not just, um, not just reassurance that things are gonna get better, you know. There's, and I think this is true, particularly true with the younger generation. You know, people want facts, um, not anecdote. And then the fourth thing I think that really good hospitals do is they innovate. 
And everywhere will tell you they innovate. But the question is, how do you respond when an innovation goes wrong? Um, the really good places will say, yep, you know, you got that wrong. Tr get back on the bike and try again. You know, it took Thomas Edison, I don't know, thousands of goes before he developed a light bulb that really worked. So innovation, we've got to, we've got to try and develop a culture where people aren't frightened to try new things. And I'm not just talking, I'm not specifically talking about new treatments. Uh, there are very strict protocols for that because if you make changes to treatments, they have to be really safe and really well thought through. But just um, simple things like how you run your outpatients department, more efficient ways of running the operating theaters, um, more efficient ways of, um, I guess, even designing the flow, the routes that people walk through an organization. So those kind of innovations. And I came to the conclusion it was those four things. And it's only recently that I've worked out why I think those four things are important. And because all of those four things are the building blocks for um, improving the quality of care that you offer. You know, look after your staff, do research, measure how well your treat, you know, how good your treatments are, know your clinical outcomes, and don't be frightened to try and push the boundaries through innovation. And so I came to, I came to that conclusion. Um, I'll probably stop there. But I, you know, I, I must say one thing is, I, you say, what are the highlights? You know, for an individual, particularly in the role that I was playing, none of those highlights are related to the individual. You know, that, They're all a team effort. They're all a team effort. And that's why I, I always feel awkward when people ask me, what are the highlights or what are you most proud of? Because I'm most proud of the people I've worked with. And you know, I was, I was thinking earlier today because it's Christmas time coming. And I'm still intrinsically, I think, a, a doctor at heart, I might be an, a you know, bureaucrat or an administrator or manager, whatever you like to call me at the moment. Um, but in heart surgery, when I was a consultant, uh, around about Christmas time, people didn't like coming in for elective operations. Uh, they'd rather stay at home with their families. And the end result of that was that uh, that you were often dealing with people who are really sick at Christmas. And I, I guess one of my real highlights is being able to give somebody back to their family in good shape in time for Christmas. You know, now that's true at any other time of year, you know, but, um, but there is, given that we're talking now and it's December, it's that kind of thing just makes you feel good. And it, makes you feel really bad when it didn't work. But the majority of times it did. And that I suppose is, is the real highlight and the real privilege of, uh, of doing a clinical role and in particular my role as a heart surgeon. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Uh, oh, that's my next question. Uh, how do you feel the general operation of the trust has changed due to the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic? And uh, what has been your key role within it all? So, it's quite, it's quite interesting because our trust is different to, uh, to many others. So, we've got three bits to the trust really. We've got a women's hospital that obviously deals with women and mainly obstetrics during COVID, uh, the mental health part of the trust and the children's hospital. Um, COVID hasn't affected our trust as much as it's affected others. And the reason is that the younger generations 
aren't as affected by COVID as the older generations. So if you look at University Hospital Birmingham, they, they were in desperate trouble as a consequence of COVID. Um, they had a lot of people in intensive care and a lot of people in hospitals and a lot of people, a lot of people dying. But around the country, I think the average age for people who died of COVID was about 82. Meantime, in the younger generation, if you take the other end of the spectrum, um, for people under 14, um, in this country and in other countries where it's been looked at, the chances of dying from COVID are, um, are less than the chances of dying from an accident in normal circumstances. Um, that's not to say people don't get COVID and may, may get sick with it, but they don't tend to die from it. So in that sense, we haven't been flooded by um, youngsters coming into our hospital very sick with COVID. But what we have had to do is we've had to think about um, the staff in our hospital. And we've had to think about social distancing. We've had to think about social distancing of the beds for the um, for the children and for the mums so that COVID isn't spread. And that's had a particular consequence in the children's hospital, I think, on our ability to do, to undertake normal treatments, normal outpatients, clinics. And so we're getting a bit of a backlog. And, and I, I worry about that. It's not as bad as a backlog as many other, as many other hospitals have got but it's still one that we've, uh, we've got to be aware of. So we've, we've done quite a bit of thinking about how to deal with that. In the, in the women's hospital, um, you know, the, the babies have kept on coming. Um, the obstetric units, the maternity units, just as busy as ever. I think we've, um, we've been pretty lucky, but it's been, it's been hard for mums because we've had to restrict who can visit them. You know, this, you know, I, I talked about Christmas earlier or, but there are times in life that are really important. It's re religious festivals, family times, and there's no greater family time really than someone else joining the family. And so it's really tough when the family can't get in there and be with mum. So um, that's been hard, but, you know, we've had to do what we've had to do to fight the virus. We've lost four members of staff as a consequence of COVID. Um, and I think, I think that's, even though the hospital hasn't been overwhelmed by patients with COVID, I think losing four members of staff has really brought it home that COVID is, you know, it's, it's a serious issue. It's a serious issue for, um, for our organization and for society. So, and when, when the first lockdown came, um, this is a slightly funny story, but actually it's, um, it's quite enlightening. I thought, well, I'll go into the hospital because I'm the chairman. I'll go into the hospital and speak to people, see how things are going. And I got into a corridor and I bumped into a surgeon who many years ago had been a trainee of mine. He says, hey, Bruce, what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, I'm the chairman. I'm coming to see people. He said, you shouldn't be here. He said, you're setting a bad example. He said, you're not a member of frontline staff. You're not treating patients. He said, you should be social distancing and at home like everybody else. And so I turned around and walked out, um, knowing that he was absolutely right. So then the question is, how do you keep in touch with stuff? So I spent an awful lot of time along with other colleagues um, on Zoom and um, found it pretty easy to keep in touch with what's going on in the hospital. Uh, it works very, very well. Um, and in many senses, um, it's made keeping in touch easier. So my role 
uh, to get back to your question, has been more about just making sure that we're, as chairman of the board, along with other board members, making sure that we're thinking of all the options that, that help us to run a, a smooth organization during COVID, that we're looking after the staff, that we're putting the right protective measures in place for both patients and staff, and that we're preparing uh, for the future. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you, Bruce. Um, my next question is, um, what do you see for the future of BWC? There are, there are two things for me, I, th I think. The first is, I've, I've been really lucky throughout my, uh, particularly my clinical career, in that I, I spent a significant proportion of that as an NHS consultant, but also a significant uh, a proportion as an academic, uh, including being, being a professor. And so I was able to travel around the world quite a lot. And I have associate academic links with a number of other um, very well-known institutions, particularly in the United States. And one of the things that became clear to me when I, um, I walked around the children's hospital was this looks great from the outside, you know, it's Disney-esque, isn't it? Um, but when you get inside, you know, it's, it's not fit for the future. Um, it's kind of quaint and quirky, um, but the wards are too small. There isn't enough space. There aren't enough single rooms. Um, you guys would be able to give me a much longer list than I could give you. Um, and it seems to me that if we're going to be fit for the future and offer a place where people feel safe and feel they're at the cutting edge, um, we need to rebuild significant parts of the children's hospital. And um, I'll just park that for a second because I'll come back to the rebuild. The second thing is you have some, in the history of medicine, there have been some really exciting times. Um, probably going back to just towards the end of the Second World War, the advent of antibiotics. I mean, we could go back further than that. There are lots of major steps, but the advent of antibiotics was obviously a very important changing point because suddenly we could treat infections. Um, actually, can I just go even further back? Uh, because it's relevant. Um, Edward Jenner, who discovered that you could vaccinate people against smallpox. That, that was a really major point in medicine because vaccination of smallpox or for smallpox enabled the complete eradication of smallpox from this planet and is said to have saved more lives than, of, than humans have lost in all the wars they've ever fought. So, you know, vaccination was a really big step forward. Um, there were some other things, but then the next thing in terms of treating disease was the advent of antibiotics. The next big thing that came along was uh, monoclonal antibodies, which are antibodies um, which could be artificially produced and could be used for treating disease. Very big step forward because it had, had an impact on treating disease, it had an impact on diagnosis um, and, and had other applications as well. We're just entering another phase now where um, I just wish I was 20 years younger because it is so exciting. And that goes under the general term of cell and gene therapy. So when I was a medical student, you know, we knew a bit about the chromosome, we knew a bit about genes. Um, we probably knew less than you would learn in your A-level classes, or maybe there are things you probably learned at GCSE, which we didn't know at that time. And 
our understanding of the human genome now is enabling us to develop highly personalized treatments that will cure diseases previously incurable. So if you really think about where we are now, you know the guy Patrick Valance, you see him on the TV, um, who is the government's chief scientific officer. He and I were professors together at University College London, and you know we also had a had a role when he first came back is uh, to work in the government. He said to me one day he had spent the best part of a decade as director of R and D for GlaxoSmithKline, the big drug company, and he said, you know, there are not many things we can actually cure. So we can cure infections. We can cure some cancers, particularly childhood cancers, and we can cure hepatitis C. But after that, you know, you've got to struggle to think about what we can actually cure. Um, many other things we just palliate, you know, we deal with the symptoms, whether it's diabetes, whether it's asthma, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis. I know I've used those examples before. Um, but now, or hemophilia, which would be a, a, or any of those sorts of diseases. But now we're getting to a point where we understand the genetic um, structures behind those diseases. We can start to offer treatments. So we're now in a position where we can cure a bunch of diseases that we couldn't cure before. Um, and I say this based on experimental data and early trial data. The trouble with these treatments is they're really expensive, really expensive. Um, but there may only be one or two treatments. So uh, that's, that's quite a big problem for a healthcare system. So, Let's imagine there's a treatment for curing hemophilia, which there is now. I don't know how much it costs, but let's say it costs 250,000 pounds. And it's a single injection for argument's sake. I'm just giving you examples. None of this is accurate. Um, nowhere can afford 250,000 pounds for a single injection. But when you take the overall healthcare costs into account, the fact that that person will now be able to attend school without having to worry about hemophilia, will able to, be, to hold down a job and be economically productive for the country uh, for a normal life expectancy, won't be visiting hospital to have their joints treated, won't be taking up uh, all sorts of hospital resources and time, and indeed may not even be visiting their GP for anything related to haemophilia because it's gone. Um, that's a major advance. We have to deal with the finances. But the fact that we can free up people from a lifetime of um, encounters, is probably the best word, with the healthcare system is a fantastic place to be in. And I sit on something called the Cell and Gene Therapy Board for the, um, for the Department of Business who's looking at this kind of stuff. And it is so exciting um, just to see all these potential cures coming around the corner. So one of the problems though with these cures is that some of them can be pretty harsh. You know, so I talk about a single injection. That single injection could make you feel as rough as anything. I don't know whether it does for hemophilia, but for some of the other things it does. And may even necessitate you being in ITU for a few days. And that's kind of the price of the treatment for the, the long-term cure. So that means when we thinking about the future of BWC, we've got to think about the, what those treatments need. So what do they need in terms of any rebuild that we're doing? Do we have to put special facilities in? What do they mean in terms of um, 
of staffing levels? What do they mean in terms of the size of hospital that we need? And so on and so forth. So, um, so the two things coming back to your question about the future BWC, one is I think clearly at both the women's hospital and the children's hospital, we need some, some new buildings um, that are more patient friendly. And secondly, that those buildings need to enable us to deliver advanced treatments that may be coming around the corner. I don't know if that makes any sense. But it is really exciting. Great, thank you, Bruce. It's very inspiring hearing you speak. So I'll go next. Um, my question is, how important do you feel participation and co-production with service users is to the trust? And how would you like the trust to engage with service users? So firstly, you'd expect me as chairman to say, yeah, it's very important. And that's where the second bit of your question is, frankly, so important. Um, I really hate the word co-production. It sounds so bureaucratic. Um, and I don't, and, and it means something different to everybody. So I already alluded before that I thought the way that we kind of treated people in the NHS, the sort of experience that people had um, was not very good. And I don't think we design and develop our services around people. We design and develop them around disease and convenience for the organization. And if we, if the, in any other kind of walk of life, people design their services around the people that need and want the services. So, you know, if Sainsbury suddenly said, sorry, you know, we, um, we only open at 10 o'clock and you have to come, you know, if, if you want porridge, you're going to have to come only in the morning. And if you want something else, you're going to have to come in the afternoon. Um, they'd soon be out of business because Waitrose or Morrison's or Tesco's would be offering something far more, um, far more palatable. Now, I just don't think we design our services around what our patients want. Um, and I'm talking in general about the health service. And so I've all, I then found myself thinking, how do, how do people who are really dependent on their customer base, how do they do stuff? They do, they do customer focus groups where they really very skillfully pin people down um, and find out what they want. And of course, uh, they do that. They stratify their customers. You know, they know what older people want. They know what younger people want. They know what young women want. They know what uh, middle-aged men want. And then they design their services to try and attract as many people as they can in those groups. So they, they have a deep understanding of the, their constituency. The second thing that really successful organizations like this do is they have data. They have real time data. Um, you know, by the time you're on the steps leaving Sainsbury's, they know exactly what you bought. You know, they might not know it's you, but they, they have huge insight into what people want and what they're buying. And we don't have that level of insight from our uh, patients. And I, I've asked um, our new chief technology officer, a guy called Daniel Ray. And after this, while I'm thinking I'm gonna get him to make contact with you, maybe Aisha, you could just be a prompt for my memory. 
I asked Daniel Ray, who's our chief technology officer, to really look at how we can put technology in place um, to understand what our patients think in every part of our organization. So I want to know what people think about each and every ward, what they think about the outpatients clinic, what they think about any experience they have when they engage with us. Um, so that we can respond immediately. And, you know, I can't think of a better place to do it than either a children's hospital or a women's hospital, because you're dealing with, in both, a youngish generation of people who are technology savvy. You know, it's not the same as, as doing it in some other organizations in the health service. So I think there's a role for you guys in that, if you don't mind me saying, um, in, in helping, us, helping us get there. Um, so I see when I worked in, if you like, as a bureaucrat in the government, co-production meant something very different. You know, you get in some advisory group, you ask them some stuff, um, you produce a policy document. Um, and then that was sort of the end of it. Um, the document where I am on this is, I think if we're going to use the term co-production, it should be about how do we get to a place where the people who use the service are happy. Now you can't do that without engaging with the people, um, whoever those people are. And I think that's through focus groups and through data and through groups such as yourself, you know, who are representative of others. I hope that helps in some way, helps you understand what I'm thinking. Perfect, thank you, Bruce. So that is the end of all our questions that we had for you. Um, I'm so quite yeah. happy if there are other questions that have come up during the course of this, um, you know, that if, if I've made some remark that's prompted people to think, hey, I'm quite, quite happy for any additional questions. Does anyone have anything else they would like to ask? They're all thinking now, they're like, oh, what could I ask? What could I ask? Should I ask a question? Okay, so I, can I ask you guys a question? I was just about to say no. that. I was like, is there anything you would like to ask us? Okay, go ahead, Bruce. Um, if there was one thing that you would want improved, in the children's hospital, what would it be? Okay, so look, you don't have to answer it now because that it's quite difficult to question like that. Um, but maybe you let Aisha know. Yeah. Um, I think if there was one thing, it would be like more involvement with young people and service users. So like. Uh, adding on to the points that you were talking about before, the service is really based on like the need of the, the people. So like if there's a specific illness, then it'll be based on that or it'll be based on what's actually going on. But I think if you involve young people a lot more and service users a lot more, then you can get a lot better of a service, if that makes sense. So that's yeah. sort of one thing I've got in my head. Yeah, and I think that's probably what I meant by that rather ugly term, focus groups. <laughs> You know, um, it, it, it's about asking people with asthma, for example, how do we improve the asthma service? Um, so it's, why, I sense from that question you don't feel engaged enough. I think in terms of engagement with YPAG, and I'm sure it's the same thing, but think from, I think a lot more can be done. I can say that with quite a bit of surety because I think people in higher levels should be taking up more of a responsibility to actively go out and speak to young people and speak to service users. Whereas at the moment, it feels like it's just a sort of side thing. It should actually be a priority because like you said, adding on to your point again, it should, the service should be based around service users and the service, the people who use the service rather than, you know, all the external factors. So I think just from my perspective, a lot more can be done in terms of people taking an active step to involve young people 
I don't know if that made any sense at all. Yeah, I did. I think we're on the same page. Um, I think what would be helpful is some thought about how. Because what I, I sense underneath it, if correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, what you don't want is some kind of tokenistic conversation. You know, oh don't worry, tick in the box, we've spoken to the young people, inverted commas. You want to actually feel that the what you say is is kind of key to the decision making process whatever that decision making process is so some thought on that you know one of the areas where i th i think we i personally would really value your input is when we get to a point about thinking about designing the new building at the children's hospital um because otherwise there's a risk you'll just get something designed by middle-aged men be awful you know, we need, we need, we're, so Older Hay Hospital, that's new. Have you, have any of you guys been there? Yeah. Um, but just look it up online. Um, they had a, they had a design group. I say of kids, I don't know what age, who helped them design it. And actually, when you walk in there, it not only feels like a children's hospital that'll appeal to scared five-year-olds or scared 10-year-olds or 15-year-olds. Um, it feels friendly, but the architecture is nice. It's airy. It feels different. Um, and I, I was taken, I went around a, a hospital with Sarah Jane's husband once when he was chief executive of the NHS. And it it was the the london hospital and it was the most expensive hospital in the health service at the time i think it had cost something of the order of a billion quid and we walked around it and he turned to me at the end and he said what's wrong with this place and i said well you know it looks pretty good to me and i was looking at it through the eyes of a surgeon you know it had everything you needed it looked fantastic uh, good outpatients, good operating theatres, looked like the laboratories were good. And he said, nah, he said, the problem with this place is, he says, it feels like a hospital. And we kind of, I'd, I'd kind of like to see youngsters helping us get out of that trap. So we've got a, we've got, I think, a problem in a sense with uh, our proposed rebuild. So I don't think anybody on the surface of it will really argue that we need some new buildings. The problem is the money's largely run out for the NHS at the moment. Boris Johnson says he's got a list of 40 hospitals. Um, we're not on that list, but we think our plans are more advanced than some people that are on that list. So we're hoping to kind of leapfrog and get on it. And it may be that, that they may add a few more hospitals. The, the problem is everybody's developing plans for a rebuild. And if you put yourself in the position of somebody that's got to make a decision, and this will be a political decision, the first, first thing you'll have to do is you'll have to have a compelling argument. Second thing you'll have to do is have a really clear financial business plan that stacks up. Thirdly, you will need to have gone through all the bureaucratic process absolutely correctly, because if anything's missing, that's how they kick you off the list. So let's imagine we have a compelling argument, a business case stacks up, we've done everything absolutely correctly, um, but so have 45 other places. Now, somebody then has to make a decision who gets um, who gets and who doesn't get the money. And it seems to me that one of the things that P 
people will look at is is how I'm trying to think of the right word but how novel is the building what does it offer that's different to all the other buildings so how does it how does it contribute to the economy the local economy how does it um, contribute to the community and how does it look different in some way you know does it enable you to deliver treatments in a completely different way does it help keep people out of hospital as a piece of architecture does it look um you know like an old prison or does it look like selfridges you know is it i suppose is it kind of sexy in a way so we've got to think about the design of the of the hospital so i'm looking at you guys we'll need to think of some way of integrating you into uh, into helping us with that we're not at that stage yet we're still at the stage of working out the business plan and all that kind of thing Thank you, Bruce. Does anyone else have anything they would like to add? Don't be shy. Yeah. This is sort of like out of the blue, but I know you were talking about before like tokenism and young people. So we were talking about how we can get young people more involved, but are you, are you ready to sort of commit in a way to actually leading by example and trying to in some sort of way connect with young people a lot more? Because I, th I think a lot of people in the trust will look towards you as a sort of, as a role model in a way. So if you sort of start the process off with connecting with young people and service users a lot, a lot more, then I feel like it, it steps up and more people will come and actually do the same thing. Yeah, it's, I think the thing that goes through my mind is what, what that kind of looks like. So it, at one level, it can be talking to you guys more. That's, that's easy enough to do. At another level, one of the things I do is I stop people in the corridor. Um, I have to be a bit careful about that because they kind of look at you a bit strangely. So I have to explain I'm the chairman or, or I work in the trust is what I usually say and ask them how, how they've been treated, how they're getting on, you know, what they think of A, B, C or D, whatever it happens to be. Um, so that's one of the ways that I find out what's happening. I also happen to have four sons who are reasonably well connected in the community and they tell me all sorts of things about what's going on. Um, but I'm open to thoughts. You see, that, that in my head, a, a hospital's there for the people it serves. It's not. It's not there for the people who work in it to have an easy time or a good time. It's um, if you can do both, then you're on an absolute winner. I think we've got some thinking to do so we can go away and kind of think about what that would look like and kind of come back. The, uh, the kind of conventional processes don't don't always work, do they? Committee meetings, people showing up and going away and not doing anything until the next, the, the night before the next committee meeting. Have any of you guys ever been to our trust board? I mean, you're very welcome. Um, you might find it incredibly boring because we have to we have to think about a lot of things. So um, there are some important things we have to think about. We have to think firstly about the finances because the worst thing you can do for your patients is lose control control of your money. You know, that is absolutely the worst thing. Um, because then you can't afford stuff and uh, you can picture it. Um, the second thing that we have to consider is are we doing everything that 
the regulators and the government and NHS England expect of us. And they have a bunch of things like waiting times in particular and uh, a few other things that we need to be sure that we're on top of. And then the third thing we have to think about is the quality of care that we offer. And we, we, we try and get through all of that, um, not necessarily in every trust board. One of the things I'm keen to do is to ensure that the, the board understands the quality of care that's offered in every service that we offer. And I think it's really important to understand that again within, within the domains of effectiveness, how effectively are we treating people? How nicely are we treating people? You know, how customer friendly basically is the service and then how safe is it? So um, surprisingly, that's quite a novel approach in the NHS. I, it's, it is really surprising, but it is. Um, Yeah, I'll go away. You guys give me some food for thought as well, actually. And I'm, uh, I'm sure gonna... you'll keep Aisha informed and she will, she'll attack me if I'm not doing stuff correctly. Attack me on your behalf in the nicest way. But thank you for your involvement and also for giving up your time on a Saturday. Thank you, Bruce. Sorry, Harry, did you have one last thing you wanted to yeah. do? <clears throat> I was just going to ask if uh, Bruce would like come up to uh, one of our meetings in like a month or so, so that we could like have like a talk with our members and like collectively come up with things to tell you and more things to ask. Yeah. And... When, I, when you say come up to the meeting, can we do it on Zoom, please? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Zoom meeting, of course. Yeah. Uh, All our meetings live on Zoom. We're Zoom professionals. Are you? Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I must say I like it. But it, it saves me from criticism about, you know, the criticism that I told you, oh, you, you know, you're not treating patients who shouldn't be in the hospital kind of thing. And, um, you know, we're tier three and you should be at home. Um, I, that's somewhere else where I've got to lead by example. Yeah, I'd be delighted. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for also giving up your Saturday. Um, you probably had a hectic week as well, so thank you for giving us... Yeah, but this, you see, for me, this is, this is probably the nicest meeting I've had in the week, <laughs> actually. <laughs> That's um, a good thing. Because it's actually, it's act, this is what matters, you know. I don't want to be chairman of a trust where people on listening to what, you know, particularly a, a children's hospital that's not listening to young people. And actually, the other thing is that one of the reasons, uh, Beth, you started off by asking me how I ended up being chair of BWC. One of the things that, uh, that struck me was the NHS kind of needs modernizing. Um, I mean, just the tech space would be an example. Um, and the, the, the example that I use for that is everybody runs their social lives, their financial lives, their travel lives um, online at the moment. You can, you know, if people want to go on a holiday, they go online, they look around, they bash away at their keyboard a bit, and the next thing is they're ready to go. Um, but when I first came to Birmingham in 1995, um, that didn't exist on, uh, on the internet because the internet existed, but the World Wide Web didn't really. So if you wanted to go on holiday, you had to go down to the bull ring and there'd be a travel agent and you'd sit in a chair and you'd wait and then they'd call you to the front um, and you would go and sit on the other side of a desk looking at the back of someone's... Um, computer screen and they say, where do you want to go? Um, and you'd name some place and they'd say, okay. And then there'd be a lot of typing that you couldn't see what was on the screen. And then they say, oh, we've got a holiday 
couple of holidays for you, one here, one there. And um, there'd be a bit of chat. Then they'd say, okay, well, we'll, um, we'll sort it out for you. And then a week later, some tickets and details would arrive in the post for you. And I, in my head, we, that's a bit like trying to get an appointment in the NHS. You know, it's really impersonal. Um, and yet the, the, um, the travel industry and other industries have, have completely transformed. We haven't done it, but you know, you guys should be booking your appointments online. You should be able to have video consultations, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it seemed to me that if you were going to embark on those kind of changes, the, the one place you could really do that would be in a hospital focused on the next generation. So there we go. Plenty of room for modernization. Thank you. Bruce. Hey, I can't promise it's going to happen. <laughs> there are many, you know, you there are many dark you know. forces at work that, that, that don't want change. <laughs> You never know. We hope there's always hope. Yeah, but you know, one of the one of the good things I think that'll come out of COVID is people have had to do stuff differently. So even, you know, even old guys like me prefer to be on Zoom than doing other stuff, and um, I think it's 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 given people a bit of an appetite for doing things in a different way. How much of that appetite remains in the longer term is still up for grabs, I think. Okay, guys. Well, look, I've kept you for too long. Thank you for your patience. And I, uh, you know, I hope you have a really good weekend. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. No, it's a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Bye. 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 Bye.